Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to log in. So uh, just hold tight and we'll get started shortly. So out of respect for everyone, um, we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are where you are zooming in from. My name is Deborah Levine. I am your community engagement officer for the City University, the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of our Dean, Dr. Ayman El Mahandez, and the whole team at the City University um, to the Cannabis Corner webinar series. This is episode one. Um, and on behalf of the Harlem Health Initiative team, we thank you for joining us for the role of public health in cannabis equity. We have an exciting series um, planned for you all. Um, and thank you again for taking your lunchtime or your breakfast or your dinner, depending on where you're, caught, you're zooming in from, to spend the next 90 minutes with us as we begin to explore public health and cannabis equity. Uh, you'll see today that um, we have um, some great sponsors with us, Community Board 10, Community Board 9, Community Board 11, um, work, the Cannabis Workforce Initiative. Um, we have the New York Cannabis Business Chamber of Commerce and also the Cultivated Community Foundation along with Mixie's Blossom. So we're super excited that everyone has come out to join us. Uh, today's conversation will be with Dr. Danielle Green, who's the Executive Director of the State and Local Public Health Initiatives here at the School of Public Health, Dr. Anisha Gandhi, who's the Director of Racial Equity and Social Justice Initiatives um, for the Bureau of Hepatitis, HIV, and STIs at our New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, always a great partner along with Marnie Garson, um, who is a scientist and is joining us to have this conversation. I'm super excited to have us all here and thank you all. You'll see for those of you who are Zooming in, um, we have our welcoming poll. And this really helps us because you know, as the School of Public Health, we have to count widgets. We need to know who's coming to hang out with us. So if you could just take a few minutes um, and fill out the poll, that would be really helpful. There'll also be a poll at the end. So if you hang out with us to the end of this program, um, we would appreciate you filling out the evaluation so that um, we have a better understanding of how to serve us. Next slide, please. So um, just some housekeeping, um, today's webinar is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. If you haven't submitted questions prior to through the Eventbrite, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you take your uh, indicator and move it around close to the bottom, you'll see that a Q&A button should pop up. If you don't see it, look to the end of your screen on the right where it says more and click that button there and the Q&A button should pop up. Please know that all questions are submitted or anonymous um, and only the presenters and the hosts are able to see them um, at the time. 
We'll do our best to answer all questions. Anything that we may not be able to cover in this series, um, hopefully we'll be able to address in future series, along with also you'll be getting uh, an email after this with some resources, the PowerPoints, um, and any additional information. Um, new alternative option throughout the presentation. You'll see that there is a QR code that's currently on the left-hand side. Uh, if you are somewhere where you're not able to pull up the Q&A, you are able to uh, use the QR code to be able to put your questions in. So having said all of that, uh, next slide, please. Here is today's agenda. Um, again, I am your moderator, super excited uh, to be able to launch this series on behalf of the school and our community constituents. We'll have a presentation that'll be done by Dr. Green to help level the field so that we're all working on an understanding of what public health is and the intersection of cannabis equity. We'll move into a conversation um, where we'll talk more about what the intersection of public health, cannabis equity, and what does that really mean in terms of the work that we do. We'll have a Q&A period and then a few takeaways, and then we will close out. Next slide. And now you get to meet our speakers. Let me tell you, these women are historically advocates in our community. They have been champions um, of voices and issues that even before we started having the cannabis equity conversation, um, they have been heroes um, doing this work. So it is super exciting for me, again, to be able to introduce this panel. You'll get to hear from them. I'm not going to spend time reading their bios. Please go back and read the bios because I want to be able to make sure that we have ample time to be able to really dive into this conversation um, but just know that these are some sheroes that we need to lift up and support as they are moving this agenda forward with us, really taking that understanding of public health and really making it a practical everyday uh, conversation so that we can do the work better. So again, Dr. Green, Dr. Gandhi, uh, Marnie, we are super excited to have you all here with us. These are our, our public health folks uh, who happen to sit in the intersection of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide. So um, in order uh, for you all, um, and I should have said at the beginning of this, there is continuing education credits that are um, attached to our webinar series, and you'll see the details as we move through, but just know that the topics today will include public health. We'll be talking about social determinants of health. And if anyone knows our Dean, he would quickly correct us and say social and racial inequities, because he likes to call it what it is. But for um, the purposes of this webinar, we will keep social determinants of health so that folks can follow in the conversation. Uh, we'll be talking about public health and some health policy. We'll be looking at social equity and the cannabis legislation. We'll be towing some conversations about what public health workforce in this new cannabis industry looks like from a public health lens. Learning objectives for today include examining the key functions of public health and protecting and improving community health, um, identifying, I'm not going to read these to you, here's what I'm going to say. Um, the objectives today are really about leveling the playing field. It's about creating a foundation for us to be able to have these conversations as we are moving forward. 
please know that the school's role in this is really to create a space where we are providing science-based information so that all of our members are of our community, whether it's faculty, community members, elected officials, or others who are just interested, understand and have science-based information to make informed decisions. Our role is not to tell you what to do, but to give you the information so that you and others can begin to have these conversations and that we can also begin to address the stigma and discrimination that's connected to these conversations. So thank you. I will decrease um, as I move forward to introduce um, what some would say is my, um, my left hand and my right hand, my partner in crime, Dr. Danielle Green. Um, for those that don't know, Danielle has been doing this work for a, a few decades. She started when she was very, very young, so I'm not telling any tales out. Um, but comes to us with a long history of working both in community, working um, in the city department of health, the state, and doing national work. So um, I'm happy to decrease as Dr. Green increases. Thank you. And I will join you back shortly after her presentation. And please remember to use the Q&A function um, so that we can record all of your questions. Dr. Green. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Deborah, I can't live up to that introduction or possibly cover all of the things you just asked for in this short amount of time. So I definitely encourage my colleagues when we get to the discussion part to fill in anything I missed because the charge Deborah just gave me is large. Um, Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am thrilled to open the first Cannabis Corner webinar and Deborah and her team has asked that I kind of provide some basic grounding principles and facts and theories so that you can all reference back to them as you move through this wonderful series of webinars that Priya and others have put together for you over the next several weeks. So to begin, before I even define what public health is, does everyone know that it's National Public Health Week right now? That we, I don't even know if everyone knows we have a National Public Health Week. That's how unknown public health is. But this is why we do this work to help everyone understand what public health is, what the importance of it is, and how it impacts everyone's lives. And so maybe next year we'll have a lot more people acknowledging and celebrating this week with us. It's always the first week of April. Um, the slides, as you're gonna see them, are sort of complementary to what I'm gonna say. So I don't read slides. So this is you know, the definition of public health officially, and I'm gonna talk more about what that means. So we are surrounded by threats to our health every day. They can come from our food, our water, our air, the places and environments and situations we live in, work in, play in, and the activities we do. And it's the role of public health to prevent all of these threats from injuring us or making us sick and to do the best we can to maintain our communities and our population's well-being. And public health, when it's most successful and works best, is invisible, which is probably why no one knows who we are or what we do and why we don't get any funding. But so there's a big um effort now amongst public health advocates to try to make people understand what public health is. We, and also that, well, public health is everywhere and a part of everything, it's actually a specialization that requires a lot of training. It's a unique discipline. We rely on training. We rely on science and evidence and data and collaborations and partnerships 
with community, with people affected by threats, with people um, trying to prevent the threats, making decisions about the threats, elected to recognize patterns and problems and take collaborative action. And it's at the intersection of social, environmental, physical, mental, and economic influences. Um, next slide. The daily um, activities of our public health workforce are very broad and diverse. Public health identifies, and to give you examples, identifies and fixes sources of lead poisoning, investigates cancer clusters, initiates educational and behavioral campaigns to help us reduce things that might harm us, behaviors like smoking, or telling us to get cancer screenings. Public health workers inspect restaurants and protect food safety. They're newborn home visiting workers who look, who look to check on families and see what they need. Public health facilitates access to health insurance, runs health insurance programs, collects and analyzes data, creates dashboards to share that data, designs and implements about and evaluates programs, writes policy and conducts research. And this is just other examples of what public health can do. So, the key thing to think about when you think about public health and how public health is different from healthcare service delivery or medicine is that public health looks at populations. We may talk about individual behaviors, but we're trying to move groups of people to be healthier and protect groups, not just individuals. So a doctor looks at what your individual determinants for cancer are and screens you to see if you may get, if you can get cancer and advises you on how to prevent it. Public health will tell you how to prevent cancer, but will also look at all the things happening around you that may increase your risk of cancer and try to adjust those things through changing the physical environment or policy or incentives and change the overall rates of cancer. Next slide. So in talking about public health from that broader picture, we've started talking about something called the social determinants of health, which play a crucial role in shaping community health and individual health. And they're often talked about as the non-medical factors like socioeconomic status, education, neighborhood and physical environment, employment and social support networks, or even access to healthcare, access to insurance and the quality of the healthcare and insurance you can access. But to break it down more simply, it's the policies that lead to those conditions and how those conditions and those policies influence health. So one example of this is you may be familiar with the practice of redlining, which in the 50s and 60s was a policy that prevented certain groups, usually people of color, from buying homes in certain areas and devalued the homes in other areas. And so over time, that's dictated where people live, what resources were available in certain areas, who could invest in those areas. But then you had things like, since those areas were devalued, property taxes were cheaper, but property taxes fund schools. So then those schools were underinvested in and the schools had fewer resources. So they the schools maybe weren't as good. And then maybe because the higher paying jobs were further away, but there wasn't reliable transportation it was harder for people in those areas to get those good paying jobs. So over time, you now have an area with poorer education, deteriorating housing, fewer employment opportunities. That, and chances are the health outcomes in that neighborhood is poorer. That's how social determinants affect health. And another way to look at it because 
the story of social determinants has been co-opted over the years is that social needs make up social determinants, but a social determinant and a social need are different. So when you look at homelessness, for example, a social need is that someone requires house, a homeless individual requires housing or a person requires more stable housing. And you can fulfill that social need by getting that individu individual into housing. A social determinant is the pervasive lack of affordable and safe and stable housing and the policies behind it. And that's why there's groups of people who are homeless. Public health systems and public health workforce come in to address how we can work with social determinants to increase resources and opportunities and services, address disparities through programming and policy development. And this is how we get to this idea that public health is everywhere. Because if poor housing or unsafe housing, because the housing has lead in it or mold or leaks and that brings in rats and other pests or doesn't have window guards, you have problems that public health addresses. So housing becomes a public health issue. Education becomes a public health issue. Um, working with labor unions and civil service and ec economic development coalitions to advocate for better job training, increased wages, benefits like health insurance and leave time so you can go take yourself or your child to a doctor's appointment or to a parent-teacher conference. Um, or be able to even have a job that allows you to get home in time to pick your child up from care. These are all become health, public health issues. And you need collaborations to advocate for these things and to increase health literacy and help people make informed decisions about their health. And that's how public health becomes health policy. Next slide. So in developing health policies and promoting health equity and improving health outcomes, um, public health needs to focus on equity and equitable access. And it's important, especially for marginalized and under-resourced communities and underrepresented communities. And it's critically important that those populations are represented in the public health workforce and are a part of the conversations about how, what programs should be implemented in those communities and what policies need to be created to um, make um, policies and access to health that helps those communities. And a very real example that just is happening now is that the New York State Assembly is debating and may hopefully pass a rule about informed consent for drug testing uh, during um, pregnancy, labor and delivery and postpartum, because we know that um, drug testing happens inequitably in the prenatal setting for people of color. And so we need to properly get informed consent and have medical reasons for doing this testing. And that's a combination, and that's a place where health policy and public health intersect. So, and that's also a part of restorative justice, not saying that there might not be times when it's medically necessary, but know why you're doing it let people know the, what's happening to their bodies, give them bodily autonomy, let them know what the consequences are and let them participate in the decision-making, especially since we now know that for most substance-exposed newborns, the best treatment for them is actually feeding, soothing, and consoling 
coming from the person who birthed them. So these are ways we can incorporate these principles into looking at underlying causes and risk factors to consider and mitigate them, to make sure resources are available and that communities are involved in development and decision-making. Otherwise, when a public health crisis occurs, it's like you're showing up to a house on fire, discovering there's no water outlet and then even though you came there to help, being blamed for the fact that both the house is on fire and there's no water. So we know we can do better than that. And that's what we want to do as we look at um, New York State and New York City's cannabis legislation and policy landscape and look at the role of public health in restorative justice and cannabis legislation and opportunities for community investment, education, and um, the transition. So I don't know if we have another slide to go to. Okay, thank you. So this is how it all connects. New York State for a long time took a public health approach to cannabis, which is why when the first thing New York State did in the cannabis space was the medical marijuana program. And that lived within the Department of Health because we wanted to, and I was with the Department of Health at the time. So if I slip into we, that's why. Um, the idea was that we wanted an evidence-based approach. We wanted it to be regulated and controlled and we wanted to make sure that other public health principles, such as the very successful campaigns at the city and state to stop, to reduce cigarette smoking, to reduce um, predatory marketing process, um, practices in um, tobacco, as well as um, we going through e-vaping, and trying to reduce youth vaping and youth cigarette use, we were trying to apply those same principles in the medical cannabis program. So for a long time, you couldn't smoke um, cannabis if you were a certified can medical cannabis patient in New York. Then, and there was quite a robust scientific and community debate process that went into developing the adult recreational use program. And when the legislation was finally passed, the Office of Cannabis Management was created. The adult use program was under their authority and the medical program was moved over so that the two programs would sit together and build off of the synergy of each other. And one of the key equity problems in the medical program was the limited availability, the limited distribution, and the fact that it was a cash-based program. It was very expensive to buy cannabis from medical dispensaries, and it wasn't covered by insurance. So there definitely was an equity issue. And one of the hopes was that having an adult recreational program would drive down the cost of cannabis in the medical program. I don't think that's happened yet, but that was one of the goals. So when we think about individuals who were disproportionately affected by the law enforcement practices during cannabis prohibition and many of the remedies um, the Office of Cannabis Management has focused on is how people who were impacted negatively by that can obtain licenses to operate legal dispensaries or be a part of the cultivation, um, marketing, and sales of the process. And much of the investment in the cannabis workforce so far has focused on those aspects. And there was a recent report that talked about how more jobs 
creation and economic opportunities in the cannabis realm would be in agriculture and agribusiness, tourism, artisan or specialty businesses, similar to small wineries or craft beer, advanced marketing, warehouse distribution, and even brownfield revitalization. But if you look at it from a public health point of view, are there jobs and opportunities for communities and for people who were harmed by the um, cannabis prohibitions beyond what Deborah likes to refer to as the flower touching jobs? You know, what does restorative justice look like for communities? What other employment opportunities are there? We're going to need HR practices in every place from schools to Fortune 500 companies that have rules about can medical cannabis use and recreational cannabis use in the workplace, off, off work hours. What about jobs that require drug testing? How are they rewriting cannabis rule, their rules regarding cannabis? Because it's not the same as it was a year ago. What other types, you know, what are the urban planning and public health jobs that could be available as you think about where um, dispens legal dispensaries could be and the rules about where they should be located and how many dispensaries should be in a neighborhood? Just be, you know, just because a area was over policed, does that mean all of the new shops should be in that neighborhood? What does saturation look like? What is the relationship between cannabis stores and corner stores and alcohol stores look like? Um, what are other places? Can we look at research to track the impact of cannabis legislation on communities? and who's go, who has access and who's you going to buy it and who isn't. Can we look at the impact of educational materials and disinformation? What do community health workers need to know? What do social workers and hospitals and medical providers and child protective services and legal services need to know in order to make sure they have up-to-date but not punitive policies? And what does this mean for new research? You know, it's legal in New York, but what does legal mean? I think we've all seen the proliferation of non-legal stores, right? I think right now, Deborah has the right number, but I think there's only 60 to 80 actual legal recreational cannabis dispensaries in New York State right now. But I'm pretty sure um, I can count 60 to, eight, 60 to 80, oh, 88. I'm pretty sure there's 100 stores selling cannabis in Manhattan alone right now. And so if there's only 88 legally in the state, what's going on with these other stores and how many people who go into them understand that they're not the legal operating stores? Um, there's also designations about research because we need know something about the health impacts. We need to know a lot more, but it's still hard to do public health research because cannabis federally is still has the most restrictive and dangerous classification. It's a schedule one drug. The White House is talking about moving it to schedule three, and this would open up the ability to conduct research and clinical trials and might even change the banking and interstate commerce laws that govern cannabis, which would have a huge impact on the availability and cost of cannabis, which would again affect um, equity and accessibility. So there's huge amounts that we can look at and we're at a point where we can really start now from scratch adopting a restorative justice approach, reinvesting in communities, addressing stigma and decriminalization, and preparing the public health workforce for these new challenges and opportunities. So I hope I've provided you with some background framing and I look forward to our fireside chat.
I turn it back to our moderator. Thank you, Danielle. That was super helpful in helping to sort of set the uh, foundation for this conversation. And I invite in, um, Anisha, is it okay if I call you Anisha by your first name? Absolutely, please do. Marnie, is that okay? I feel like this is family and we, we wanna have a real conversation here. Um, so having said all of that um, and helping us sort of think through what all of that means, um, I would like to give both of you an opportunity to just um, respond to that and open up. Um, so Marnie, do you wanna go first and, and sort of introduce yourself and tell folks um, what you're doing and some thoughts about um, how this sort of rolls out? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Marnie Gerritsen. I'm an epidemiologist with experience managing health economics and outcomes research studies, really leveraging real world evidence, which is data that's generated outside the context of clinical trials. And I provide scientific direction and support for, science, for studies generating uh, this high quality real world evidence using healthcare data, whether that be electronic health record data, insurance claims, patient reported outcome measures uh, to advance equitable patient access and inform regulatory decision-making in the realm of uh, patient-focused drug development. And I'm also a medical cannabis user and advocate for really identifying ways to use data to accelerate culturally responsive patient-focused drug development. And so I think it's important to just give a little bit of a context uh, to help folks understand what real-world evidence really is um, and as I mentioned previously, it is uh, typically evidence that's generated outside the context of randomized control trials, but it helps paint a picture of disease burden, treatment patterns, patient behaviors, and product performance in settings and populations in routine clinical care. And so real world data is collected in three buckets where that can be clinical, where we're looking at adherence and survival rates, economic, when we're looking at medical resource utilization, as well as humanistic, um, as it relates to health-related quality of life from existing or new data. And I think one specific advantage of real world evidence is that it can be captured based on everyday clinical practice, but also allows us to study large samples and populations that are often excluded from clinical trials. And as we know, there tends to be an overrepresentation of the uh, normative population in clinical trials that is not reflected of my experience um, or many other people's experience on this panel. And so I think that it has been a mission of my career to really legitimize the value of this data that we already know is being collected. Uh, it's already in the pipeline. Um, it's just not necessarily being valued and utilized in the most appropriate ways as an advocacy tool. And so I think that there you know, are important distinctions to be made from the, the rigor of the quality of evidence that can be made or generated in randomized clinical trials, but there have been uh, progress and legislation that the FDA has been able to use to accelerate medical product development utilizing uh, real world evidence. I think it's going to require um, a lot more federal buy-in. And I am encouraged by the nature of the conversations to deschedule uh, cannabis, but I don't think that's necessarily the end all be all. And before I go uh, any further, I do wanna pass it off to Anisha so she can also introduce herself as well. Thanks so much, Marne. And I'll also acknowledge um, Marne is a, a former colleague and it's been such a delight to continue the conversation around um, both this topic and some related ones. So not only thinking about cannabis, but other um, classes of, of substances like entheogen. So things like, um, like psilocybin, um, LSD um, that have, you know, that had a long history of being studied for potential public health um, and clinical benefits um, due to political reasons. Some of that, you know, got buried and is having a resurgence. So a lot of what we're talking about today not only applies to thinking about being cannabis ready, but how can we sort of open things up so that um, 
that you know as as additional things come forward in the research pipeline that we are really thoughtful and responsible and equitable in terms of how these move out into into kind of a scale up and, and greater use um, within pop the population and especially within communities who who need more support. Um, so my name is Anisha Gandhi. I use she/her pronouns. Um, as um, as our wonderful organizers mentioned, I currently sit um, in the New York City Health Department and lead um, <clears throat> excuse me our racial equity and social justice initiatives program within the Bureau of Hepatitis, HIV, and STI. So a little bit further away from doing cannabis work every day, but my role there and and what my work has been um, for the last many years has really been thinking about embedding equity into all of the work that, that I sit in um, at those intersections of hepatitis, HIV, and STIs, but really um, working to, to shift that kind of perspective and the, the actual action of the health department at large. So I work at multiple levels um, within the health department to both kind of make changes within our public health workforce in terms of um, making sure that that experience in and of itself is um, more equitable and then also helping to prepare our institution at large to really operationalize that and put that into action in our programs, in our practices, in our policies, in our culture, in the way that we engage with communities um, with the idea really being um, that, um, that when we shift the way we do our work um, and really center equity that um, we will ideally see a reduction in, in inequities um, in the communities that we serve. So for the New York City Health Department, that is for all of New York City. Um, and so I, I come with an epidemiology background, um, sort of at the in intersection of social and um, infectious disease epidemiology, and have been in the realm of public health for around 20 years, mostly focusing on um, sexual and reproductive health and HIV and STIs but very much um, you know, through not just my academic work and training and research um, and now kind of public health practice, but have also been involved in service advocacy with um, a lot of different populations that we would you know, consider to be the ones bearing the brunt of what inequities look like in society. So um, sort of populations at intersections of being marginalized in different ways, um, regardless of whether um, they are they are actually a minority or not. So I'm I'm mindful of not really speaking about minorities in the New York City context because um, people of color who who often are marginalized and experience worse outcomes are the majority in New York City, um, not a minority. So um, I'll be you know talking about people of color and and acknowledging some of these other intersections um, when it comes to you know neighborhood uh, immigration status, um, you know sexual orientation, gender identity. So. Um, these are, you know, uh, people who have, um, you know, different kinds of immigration status or immigration histories, um, people who are living in higher poverty neighborhoods. Um, these are a lot of, you know, identities that often overlap in our city. Um, we know also that um, that a lot of these communities have worse health outcomes in almost every, you know, area. Um, we know that even just in the United States, um, people, many people of color and especially um, Black Latino um, and indigenous peoples, um, essentially they have a shorter life expectancy. This is not because of biology. This is not because of behavior. This is due to systematized oppression and injustice in our systems, um, in, in our policies, in the services that are provided, in the way that we provide access for people to be healthy and to stay healthy. Um, and through a lot of intersecting kind of realms and structures. So not just within health and healthcare institutions, but in education, um, in, in law, in housing. So all of those things have intersected for really the history of our country to produce these very different health outcomes. So when we talk about equity, um, what we mean is giving people what they need. Um, and that is acknowledging that people need different things because we're not all starting from the same place of advantage or disadvantage. So it's helping to restore people to having an equal opportunity to stay healthy for their full lives, recognizing that, that we have not set people up in the same way to achieve that goal um, and really reallocating resources and recentering our priorities 
so that we make sure that we take care of those who have been the most underserved and who have the greatest need. Um, so that's really the kind of framework that I approach um, my work with and, and sort of use data, engaging with different communities, um, strategic advocacy to help, you know, continue to advance that um, in our work at large. So, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I think all of this very deeply applies to the, the additional rollout of, of cannabis. And um, certainly I think there's a lot of room um, for the many healthcare professionals on this call for students to help support and kind of find new opportunities to help the public health workforce and our fields um, be more cannabis ready. So happy to talk more about that with, with all of you. Thank you. That, that, so you see why I'm super excited about the conversation today. Um, Marne, uh, Danielle, both of you have spent some time uh, focusing on the medical cannabis impact um, and in particular around substance use. And so Marne, can you tell us a little bit about what that means around public health and how that work around medical cannabis and what our role is in that process? Sure. I think there has been literature published to help demonstrate that state medical cannabis laws have been associated with a reduction in opioid prescriptions. Specifically, there is an article published by Lopez in uh, 2020, where they're looking at orthopedic surgeons leveraging Medicare Part D data to highlight population level findings where legalization of medical cannabis and patient access to dispensaries may actually be associated with reductions in opiate prescribing by orthopedic surgeons. So I think it's important to highlight the impact of how this policy can really advance patient quality of life where medical cannabis laws were associated with a statistically significant reduction of 72,000 daily doses of hydrocodone annually. And so states with active medical cannabis laws also found a statistically significant 19.7% reduction in Medicare Part D opioid prescriptions. And I could go on and share a lot of these interesting statistical findings, but I think from taking it at a higher level humanistic uh, perspective, we can see that, you know, looking at other articles, decreases in opioid prescriptions uh, were noted by 2.11 million daily doses per year. And hydrocodone use was decreased by 17.4%, as well as morphine use having decreased by 20.7%. And these are articles that have been published in the literature fairly recently, uh, within the last five to 10 years. And so there is an evidence base that has been established and needs to grow to really articulate the value of this public health policy. Now, I think it really comes down to us as users, as consumers, as public health professionals, really being able to take this evidence and leverage it to the policymakers and enforce them, hold their feet to the fire to really be able to advocate for the life saving um, that can life savings that can come from the use of medical cannabis. I think uh, specifically, it's interesting to note um, just the medical cannabis program in New York State as a whole, where now we have uh, 12 qualifying conditions uh, that are available um, for folks to be able to access, but there are still systemic barriers and limitations for who is able to certify patients um, and the types of patients that are able to afford uh, paying for this. Um, Every year, your license may expire. And so there's a recertification process too that also uh, introduces additional structural level barriers. But I think, you know, I, it's important to highlight uh, not only using the current systems and infrastructure in place, but also identifying tools and data that can help us advocate for reestablishing a structure within the healthcare ecosystem that is representative of consumers' current lived experience. And that's where I think real world evidence and real world data can really be an advocacy tool to decolonize the molecule to market research development pipeline. 
And I'm using that language traditionally because I think there is a holistic view of patients that is not captured in the traditional R&D pipeline um, that many pharmaceutical manufacturers have to employ in order to actually have a medicine be available on market and then identify the populations that would benefit the most from that specific product. So I do think that um, really leveraging real world evidence in the realm of allowing us to identify the set and setting, the intention and integration of how users are not only leveraging cannabis and cannabinoid based medicine, but also entheogens uh, to honor the traditional aspects of plant medicine, but also help provide evidence to quantify the economic impacts, the cost savings, the health state utilities that may be improved by using these traditional plant medicines versus Western medical techniques, but also cumulatively, cumulatively will add a net health benefit to the patient, which, you know, should be the ultimate goal for those working in public health and working in the healthcare system as a whole. Thank you, Marnie. I know, Danielle, I saw your head bobbing over there. So as an author of a, a particular article that we'll be dropping into the chat around substance use and cannabis, can you speak to that? Or Deborah. Um, no, I agreed with what a lot of with what Marty was saying, Marde was saying, and um appreciate the article she mentioned. Um and we and it's true, a lot of administrative databases or real world data, um, to put it in more simpler terms, has looked at states that had a medical marijuana program and what happened overall to prescribing. And so it's like you were looking at two points of data and you know one went up, one went down. What we were able to do partially as a result of some of New York's really annoying, highly regulated parts of the <laughs> medical marijuana program that I know people had issues with was that um, we had records of every dispensing. So we were able to actually do a match in the um, prescription monitoring database, which also has every opioid prescription, and look at people who were on chronic opioids, long-term opioid use, and um, separate those into people who tried medical marijuana, picked up medical marijuana once and never got a dispensing again with people who continued on medical marijuana and actually track their individual um, prescription opioid use and medical marijuana use. And we saw that their actual dosages, the amount of opioids they were taking dropped significantly over time with continued medical marijuana use. So, and it's one of the only studies that was looking at that individual level and what happened. Um, and it goes to what Marne was saying about plant-based and some and traditional medicine, um, traditional healing that we haven't taken seriously for a long time actually has pain reducing benefits and can be used on its own or in conjunction with Western medicine. And while there may be negative effects from anything you take, depending on who the individual is, we're not saying you know everything's safe, people don't overdose and die from cannabis the way they do from opioids. And people, and we're still prescribing opioids for pain relief at levels that are really risky. And what's also happening because the pendulum swung back and we're trying to reduce opioid prescribing, reduce high dosages, re um, crack down on providers who are recklessly prescribing is that people are getting cut off. People who, because opioids are addictive, 
even if you're using it for pain management and they're on very high doses for long periods of time. And then their provider is investigated and may not even be doing anything wrong because there's fewer and fewer providers who are willing to treat people at high level, at high dosages of opioids. Those providers are getting shut down or investigated and other providers are afraid to pick those patients up because they're so dependent on such high levels. And those patients are incredibly at risk of turning to um, now drugs they can get on the street that have fentanyl in them or overdosing or doing other things that put them at more risk. So we need to find ways to not just help people access cannabis so they never go on opioids, but stop people from being in those very dangerous positions that medical practice has put them in. And cannabis, in our study kind of said, cannabis may be a way to do that. The other thing we have to acknowledge is that even before there were medical marijuana programs, people were self-medicating with cannabis. And whether they were buying it legally or not, there is a whole group who now are using taking getting cannabis through the recreational program that maybe we want to consider should be looking at medical cannabis because there's different opportunities there for what the combinations of H of THC and CBD are, the different modalities through which they can get cannabis, and they can be talking to trained pharmacists, another public health job, or trained educators about what their symptoms are and what modes of cannabis could be most helpful to them. But we're not really trying to braid that together either yet. I'll stop. Sorry, that was a lot. No, I that's great. And I would actually jump in there as a place where um, it's, it's going to be so critical um, for us to really ensure a different level of awareness and understanding around cannabis, not only across the health, sort of health research, public health, um, health provider kind of arenas, um, but also continue this community-based education um, for this reason that as cannabis becomes more accessible, Danielle, you suggested that maybe there's, you know, a hundred unlicensed dispensaries in Manhattan. I would guess it's much, much higher just based on walking around and seeing what is available all over the place um, that I, I, will, I will share for my part that I remember um, as a teenager, um, having this conversation, I think my dad was trying to give me some sort of, you know, anti-drug talk. And he mentioned, you know, and he, my parents both immigrated from India, um, in the seventies, um, at for school. And he mentioned that, you know, when he was in grad school, he's like, I, you know, I smelled something funky at this party and I just walked right out. And that that was like his entire sort of exposure to cannabis. And it was clear in that conversation that for him, it, you know, cannabis was essentially equated with like the severity and risks of heroin. And so again, living in this very, very rich city with such, you know, different cultures, different languages. I think a third of our city has limited English proficiency. So many people are born in other places that may have both a different relationship to cannabis. And I think generationally there's different understandings and stigmas as well. Um, and so having people understand what this is, um, what it can do both in terms of risks and potential benefits, and just what may that experience be like um, is going to be so important because as we know, there are a lot of things that are FDA approved as medications that, that also come with a lot of risks. I think we've all seen those ads that are like, oh, this is something to treat one condition, but also it may cause death or very severe illness, right? And we know that a lot of times things that are, are illicit and that are scheduled differently as controlled substances are actually much safer and safer for a lot of people. And so it's going to be important for people to understand how does this gonna work with my body? What might the impacts be? short and long-term, 
How does this interact with other medications I'm taking? Um, how might this support me? How should I incorporate it? What should I incorporate? What do regimens look like that make sense for me? Um, and also have be able to have an open conversation with all of their healthcare providers because it's going to be really important for providers to understand that use and also destigmatize you know, being able to talk about those things, especially given that, you know, we, we are in, in a, in a state where this, um, the, you know, access is legalized. Um, so it's, you know, people need to be able to have those conversations and, and providers need to be able to hold those conversations in a way where they both aren't passing judgment and understand the science and clinical implications well enough to really support all patients and introduce and educate patients as well that may not have considered this as um, as an option and potentially as a better option um, than some of the things they may be considering. Thank you. So I'm glad you brought all of that up because it makes me want to then ask the question, what are some of the current gaps and challenges in cannabis research, public policy that need more attention? How, how, what do, what are we doing? Or what aren't we doing? Well, I think there are numerous research challenges that I've experienced um, personally and professionally. Like first and foremost, given the complex nature of cannabis, there are a thousand and one medicines in one. Given the endocannabinoid system and the potential for variability for the plant to offer um, depending on how it's cultivated and uh, brought to market. I think in that same vein, there are a wide range of products, doses and routes of administration that could also be generated because of the biodiversity of the plant. And then as you can imagine, um, how do we conceptualize research study designs to account for the unique architecture of this plant medicine. So there, essentially it can be very difficult to blind um, given the psychoactivity of the molecules present in cannabis and uh, offer placebo designs because the challenge of the cultural richness um, of this plant. I think I've also experienced really a, a limitation as it relates to funding where majority of federal funded uh, research studies are relating to harm. Um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has offered uh, funding opportunities for local universities, uh, but it's within a lens of the negative benefits of the plant, not necessarily with an open uh, opportunity to conceptualize the full scope of benefit to the patient or identifying ways for us to conceptualize what a net health benefit could look like in relation to the patient profile, their comorbidities, the context with which they would have to take this medicine as well. And majority of the research that is currently available through randomized controlled trials, there is a highly selective process to uh, become DEA certified, um, to have labs that grow specific strains, of uh, cannabis. So there is a threshold and a barrier to entry that is not accessible to many uh, individuals within public health or the healthcare workforce that have the skills that are interested in becoming cannabis ready, but just systematically and structurally are not included in the conversation or given the opportunities to leverage their passion and skill set. And so I think there's Obviously, uh, the lack of diversity in participant recruitments um, because of that, whether or not professionals would like to participate in these studies themselves or contribute to the evidence generation process as well. And as you can imagine, that trickles down to challenges in how this data is being collected, um, where we're experiencing challenges in poor study design because of these structural and systematic barriers and uh, obviously conducting clinical research within the context of COVID or a post-COVID world, as you may say. Um, and it really often is 
difficult to conceptualize how we can continue to identify opportunities for cannabinoid-based research within the current paradigm of the drug development pipe pipeline. And so that's where I do think it's important to be able to have studies that leverage currently existed data, whether that be electronic health record data, administrative claims data, survey data, where we're actually asking patients in naturalistic settings, what is their willingness to use medical cannabis as it relates to the other treatment options that have been made available? Or what would their care look like if they were able to use cannabis as an adjuvant therapy as well? Not just conceptualizing that for patients in need of palliative care, but also patients that may be experiencing conditions as it relates to anxiety, bipolar disorder, where there is evidence base um, identifying the unique benefits uh, that can be generated from the use of cannabis or entheogen substances. And I'll add on to that and would love um, to also hear Danielle's thoughts um, that I think, um, and, and sort of just piggyback off of some of what Marnay had shared, that we, we have a system in, in this country and globally of what we consider to be the most important and the most valid um, information. And in public health, we are taught that, you know, a randomized controlled trial is the gold star and really what we should be trusting and that you know, qualitative research, smaller samples, um, case studies are are less valid, less useful. However, um, this you know this research pipeline, as Marnie mentioned, is is divorced from the underlying reality of people's lives. Um, is not set up to include. Um, it is is right now not supporting. Um, scientists of color um, to lead these in the same way that it funds and supports um, you know, white identifying um, experts. It's often tied to universities um, and, and not necessarily as accessible to people who aren't outside of these kind of major urban hubs that have academic research or medical centers. Um, so yeah, so we don't have as much information on, um, on what these outcomes look like for people of color. We certainly have done a bad job overall in public health um, in this country of incorporating the centuries of wisdom that have come from indigenous communities, from communities of color, from, from people in general around you know, how, th how things, um, cannabis and other things have been used um, and what the sort of you know, effects are both in terms of strengths and benefits as well as potential risks. Um, so we also need to shift who is creating that knowledge to make sure it better matches our populations and our populations who can benefit from that research and who's participating. Um, so that those are some real gaps that will continue to need correcting um, in our work. And I will I will also just note because I didn't do this at the outset that um, I'm I'm sharing you know opinions and perspectives that are my own, not representing the health department at large, although I will note that the New York City Health Department is, is very committed both in name and continuing ongoing improving practice um, to addressing um, racism as a public health crisis and to incorporating equity into all we do. Um, yeah, would love to hear from you, Danielle. A lot, yeah. So as a qualitative researcher by training who really had a fight for the fact that my work was as valid as those who did quantitative methods, you're really speaking to my heart. Um, I think that part of why, look, there's a role for both. I think that the idea of the randomized clinical trial as the gold standard comes from the medicalization of public health. And if we go back to the fact that public health is not medicine, and you know, there's a lot of people who see public health as kind of an offshoot of critical care or healthcare delivery. I kind of see public health as the bigger system and umbrella and that healthcare delivery and medicine are within it because we're doing population. And individuals make up population, but that's a radical way of flipping the paradigm. Um, so, 
Yeah, I think, you know, if you're doing a drug trial, sure, randomized clinical trials make sense. I think there are other things they make sense for. I think that if you're looking at behaviors or the way populations move, it's very important to look at real world settings. If you remove everything that might contaminate or control your study, you're also not getting how people actually do the things. And then we come back and are like, why didn't this work when we went to generalize it and replicate it? It's like, well, the things that really affect things um, aren't, weren't studied. And, um, you know, I've long heard, as I did some of the cannabis research, that, you um, the approved cannabis that you're allowed to use in clinical trials, I think many because as a result of many of the things Marnay di discussed, is very different than the cannabis you buy in the world. And the effects of it are very different. So as a result, I think we've seen a lot of cannabis clinical trials that say, well, we're not really sure it had pain relief effects, but we're not really sure they were using cannabis as everyone else would access cannabis. And also from some of the things that Marne said, it doesn't sound like any of those approved trials are looking at the other modes of administration because you're not going to grow ointments or lozenges or sprays in your lab. And there's reasons in terms of how quickly things impact you or slow or you know have longer duration or what you can do over time why people might choose one thing over another so we're losing a lot of um information um oh my god anisha you said so much i think i only answered one thing that you flagged um i think we're also not stepping back oh because you both talked about how we only look how we do a harm focused approach to a lot of the research and not just benefits. Um, you know, we also need to look at kind of how do we modulate things? I think that there's been a lot of studies coming out recently that are like increases um, in incidence of asthma and prevalence of asthma among homes in which cannabis was used, right? Or adolescents using cannabis having more asthma. Um, and asthma is a huge problem, particularly in certain communities and among certain populations. And it goes back to a lot of the things Nisha was talking about at the beginning of her remarks. But I want to see the study that kind of looks at, you know, cannabis um, lozenges or ointments and asthma or why people were you who have um, asthma were using cannabis. I think there's an assumption that it was recreational and that it was smoking. And we know all smoking affects asthma. So that's not surprising. But is it, right? What if there was something else that they were using? Would there still be that effect? Um, and at the same time, we need a common sense approach. Like just because we're saying there's good reasons for some people to use cannabis, we don't mean use it constantly and all day long. Just like we don't want you drinking alcohol all day long. And just like you shouldn't drink alcohol and drive. You know, there are things you shouldn't do while you're under the effects of THC, which is the psychotropic piece of cannabis. So we need to be more careful in how we talk about this and we need to look at how and when and why people are using it. And then we didn't even touch on the housing policies um, that actually affect who can use cannabis safely. I don't know if Mar Marnay or Anisha want to get into that more, but yeah, there's a lot at this intersection we should be looking at. So thank you. Let me just um, acknowledge some of the comments that have been dropped into the question and answers. Um, there's a statement here that says, this is true as someone who works in a dispensary helping patients or recreational users, unlearned stigmas uh, is important so they can be comfortable using cannabis as medicine. 
which sort of also um, moves me into this um, thought around um, if you all would address what kinds of skills, knowledge, roles will be necessary um, for the field of public health to have a sort of holistic incorporation of cannabis and to be cannabis ready. Um, I wanna make sure that we're, we're putting um, some focus on roles and what we need to be thinking about. So um, who would like to kick that, that part of that conversation? Anisha, I see you smiling because you've got thoughts. I mean, I could talk about these things for lots of time. So I will, I will say that, especially coming from the health department, we, th there's not a sector I can think of in public health and healthcare that doesn't need support to be more cannabis ready. So if you are interested in public health and this is a passion area for you, there is room for you to contribute um, because this is something that I think intersects with so many other parts of how we think about our own health and well being that it doesn't matter if I primarily work in HIV, I should know about the science, use, availability, access of cannabis. What I the the thing that I will name and then pass it off to, to other others who I think have lots more to add around research and policy is that people who can um good communicators and health educators are going to be core to this because as we've named, um, we need to re-educate people at large and certainly people across the field of public health about cannabis use, where we are with the science and what we know and don't know, what this, you know, how this interacts with other things, what the potential benefits are. That needs to happen starting from how we educate people. So that needs to be part of curricula in schools of public health, in schools of medicine as a requirement. I certainly was not taught anything about cannabis in my public health education. Um, and I know that that continues to evolve. Um, and I think um, having people who can also really connect with folks and involve and more meaningfully involve community members and people who really could potentially benefit and have been underserved by current cannabis access or who have been most harmed by criminalization, um, those kinds of liaisons and people who certainly, given that we need more evidence um, and need to better include marginalized communities, communities of color, folks who very appropriately have distrust in either government public health um, systems and infrastructure or research infrastructure, given the ways that you know communities of color have been deeply harmed by some of these kinds of efforts um, in the past and, and in an ongoing way um, and also excluded, we need people who also can connect um, and tailor messages um, and information um, to communities, to different age groups, to people who have different cultural contexts um, so that this actually translates and so that people can really make their own informed choices about whether they want to engage in research, whether they want to ask their doctor, um, or provider about cannabis, whether they want to seek that out on their own. Um, so somebody, you know, folks who can communicate clearly, who are interested in continuing to learn, and who have, you know, lived or professional experience engaging with marginalized communities, all of that is going to be key. You do not, I think, like, it's not about just having those technical skills and, you know, being great at analysis. That's wonderful and a wonderful asset. But there is so much more that I think a lot of people hold um, as their talents or strengths that they've built up um, that have so much application in this arena. Marne, I see you smiling. Yes, I was going to add, um, really, it's less about the technical or uh, professional skill set and more so understanding a passion for advocacy. I think there are specific character traits that will be beneficial for folks wanting to identify opportunities to utilize an intersectional skill set. And I think that first needs to start at understanding where empathy can start and how you can infiltrate empathy in the work that you do and how you advocate for whether it's data or the patients or the services that you provide, I think it's critical to understand the patient cost 
and the story of why people are turning to cannabis as medicine and why that may be the first modality that is available to them. And rather than um, wanting to continue really regurgitating a stigma that they may experience through normal routine clinical care, uh, being able to provide a safe space for people to want to continue to choose treatments that are in alignment with their own personal value system, economic preferences, and choices, whatever is driving that choice. And to be able to identify opportunities to validate their experiences in that way, but offer support and resources as to be able to identify if there's you know, a, a relationship between their use that needs to be uh, rethought or essentially be able to give them dosing protocols to say that if you are, you know, in the sense of wanting to be using cannabis every day, have a thoughtful conversation um, in dispensaries with pharmacists able to say, what is driving your use? Is there a different modality that could be more efficacious? in achieving the outcome that you're looking to receive. And I think that goes to my next point of really being able to not only infiltrate the public health workforce, but also the cannabis industry as a whole. I think now the nature, especially as more markets become focusing in adult use, that we are not necessarily identifying the patient or consumer to be the real architects of their destiny. I think. There has been a culture shift in the industry to prioritize profit margins, which in any uh, business that will be the case. But I do think that we are in a unique position, leveraging our skills in public health to be able to course correct and find opportunities, applying health equity frameworks, community-based participatory research to identify ways that we can infiltrate the humanistic perspective from the entire pipeline of cultivation of bringing able of bringing you know the medicines to market and identifying where dispensaries should even be located who has access to those dispensaries and how people are treated in those dispensaries as well so danielle i would also encourage your thoughts as well oh i second and third everything that's been said so far um the only things i have to add are I think, you know, as we move towards more recreational, legal recreational dispensaries being opened, um, one of the things that I'm concerned about, as Marnay said, is about keeping it patient and consumer focused and honoring their journey, but also making sure that the quality of the sales force and the knowledge they have and the education so that they can have the type of conversations Marnay just described stays there. I mean, for people who aren't familiar with the medical program, that staff is so trained and knowledgeable and it was so intentional. And as this becomes a more common, more marketplace driven product, I worry about that aspect of this um, experience disappearing and people who work in the, especially on the recreational side, not having that knowledge and training to help people make informed decisions. So being a part of that workforce, making sure we have policies that ensure that is the training the workforce gets and the level of the workforce and then, um, you know, Marnay mentioned that it's a becoming a profit driven business. And before she said that, I was also thinking about we don't often talk about the economics in public health. And we need people who are looking at both the economics from a public health and from an equity perspective and are trained in the economics to look at. You know, we're a capitalist society, for better or worse. These businesses have the right to make a profit but they have a lot of investors, but then how do we also balance that with their, their success with making sure this is affordable and equitable and accessible for the largest population possible? And who's gonna make the case for why eventually, if this is a medicine, 
it should be reimbursable and covered by insurance. And how do we make an economic case as well as a health case for that? So I'd say that's the other place where we could use um, people who are passionate about this. Well, thank you. It sounds like we still have a lot of work to do and there's lots of places where public health um, has an appropriate place to step in and work side by side with community as we figure out sort of the nuances of how this new industry is going to be rolled out and ensuring that the diversity, equity, and inclusion is included. I can't believe that 90 minutes has gone by as quickly as it has which is um, both sad but exciting because that means um, that this conversation has more legs to it and that there are more reasons for us to continue to come back and explore ways that public health really is an integral part um, as this legislation continues to evolve and roll out. Um, just really quickly, I wanna give each of you a quick minute to give us one takeaway in your thought process as we uh, move towards closure, but I would be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity for um, a quick takeaway. So Anisha, you wanna start? Sure, I will just offer that we are at a state of health inequity in this country, and if we, in order to get to a place of health equity, of everyone having what they need and not having their um, their sort of health outcomes, their life outcomes determined by what they look like, their, their identities, things that they cannot control, um, we need to approach public health differently. And that means embedding equity into every aspect of how this field works. Um, so coming in with that mindset um, and really redistributing resources and services to communities most impacted by harmful policies to date will be critical and do in, infusing that into the way that cannabis is scaled up will be, um, will be so important. And so just very much looking forward to um, everyone um, in this talk and beyond um, contributing to that effort. Marnie? I would also like to add that I think there funda fundamentally needs to be a shift in power benefiting these communities facing the inequities we've described both personally, individually, but at the various systematic levels to be able to be the architect of their patient journey as they want to achieve better health outcomes. I think we need to be able to advocate for a healthcare ecosystem that continues to prioritize the patient experience first leveraging all of our tools at our disposal. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and just adding on to that theme um, and having, you know, all of the groups and people who haven't had the chance to be a part of making the policies and making the decisions so is how we're going, like the people most affected by all these things um, have to be part of the group that makes the decisions and makes the future policies. Thank you all. Appreciate uh, your input and your time, your energy, your talents. But most of all, thank you for agreeing to launch our Cannabis Equity Series. I um, want to take an opportunity to thank our partners again, as you see on the screen here. We thank you for your trust. Um, it is really our, our, our goal to continue to create safe spaces to have these hard conversations and to also create space of training the next set of public health leaders that are cannabis ready. So thank you. Um, you will see here, um, we're thanking our folks. Remember that you have access to getting continuing education credits. Thank you again to our incredible speakers. 
Um, and April 18th, we have our next uh, series that will coming up is Cannabis History and Practice Across the Industry. Um, we're really excited to be able to talk about labor, labor laws, and the intersection of public health and cannabis equity in this work. So thank you again to our partners and to our Harlem Health initiative team for doing an outstanding job of putting these uh, together. Priya, thank you for pulling all of us together in this process. Tanisha, Cameron, um, thank you all. As you see here, we couldn't do this without our social media connects. So I would ask that you all take out your phones immediately, if not sooner. And please follow us on our newsletter because all of the upcoming events will be there. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Um, and as always, we have a closing poll. So I would ask that you please spend a few minutes just answering that for us. You see that Priya has dropped also upcoming events in the uh, chat. But most of all, we thank you for taking the time, the energy to come and spend this time with us. So please fill out the closing poll for us and we will see you on April 18th.